Hello everyone, uh, welcome to today's live stream. Uh, I've got something very different for you today, and by something I mean someone. Um, I am joined by Mark, who is my good friend. Um, he will be sharing his story with you today, um, as well as us taking questions from you guys. Uh, any questions that you might have um, with regards to living with terminal cancer, living with stage 4 cancer, thyroid cancer, and um, having a laryngectomy, Mark is an expert in that. Um, also, if you've got questions about my rather obvious attractive neckwear, um, will I diamond and cross it? I don't know, maybe I will. Um, yet to be seen. That'd be amazing, really. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Um, very crackly audio. Oh, no. Don't say that. Because I don't, I don't, I don't want to hear the. I don't want to hear about crappy audio. It's not a huge amount I can do to fix it. So. It did this last time, and it sorted itself out. Did it? It did. Yeah. Right. What I'll do is, it's very crackly. Give me one moment. I'll attempt to fix it through. How's that for everybody? Is that better? Not necessarily the same, but better. Fixed, fixed, yay! yay. Perfect. Good. Right, that is. What are we doing? Oh, God, I, you know what? What? I absolutely hate technology. Surprisingly, how much I've got <laughs> sat in front of us. But there we go, we're sorted, we're on, we're rocking. It means that we've lost another story. And everyone who's arrived has got to witness my wonderful tech skills for fixing these things. Um, but basically what it is, we're now using the microphone off of the camera, as, ah, it, as opposed to off of this. So let's get that we'll out of my freaking way. way. So, um, um, yeah, even my dad says he can hear us. Hi dad. Um, also, hi mum, because I assume you're watching too. Um, Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Plater. Hi. This is Mark. Yeah, obviously, you've met Dad. You've Dad, met Mark already. Yeah. Yeah. So, improvise, adapt, and overcome. Um, or maybe we will uh, adapt and assimilate information. Because well, of that, yeah. Because of what's going on behind us. Um, but right. As we were trying to say, what I was doing was um, today's stream is going to be um, storytelling question answering um, so if you have any questions um, then throw them in chat um, we'll get to them and we will 
go through them as they come in. Um, I'm going to say no question is off limits. Um, we will just choose not to answer it if we decide it is. That's it. Um, and it will just be soz, we ain't answering it. That's it. That's the way it's going to be. Um, but Mark is going to start off with telling us a bit about how his journey with cancer began, how it's been so far, because that's going to be a fun one, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and how, um, well, what your next steps are as well, I guess, when we get to that point. Cool. Okay, well, hi guys, my name's Mark, um, I'm temporarily hijacking um, the channel this afternoon. Um, you can probably hear there's something different about my voice. That's slightly bork like weirdly enough. Um, and it's because I don't have any vocal cords. And I'll come on a bit later to explaining how that all works. Because uh, it's very clever. Um, my journey with, um, with incurable thyroid cancer started in Nando's. Now that doesn't mean that you shouldn't go to Nando's. Um, because you should go to Nando's. We love Nando's. Yeah. Um, but it's not sponsored. Yeah, not sponsored. Um, but yeah, I, I was sat eating chicken as you do, and um, I was leaning on my neck, and I felt a lump in my neck, and I tipped my head back and I said to my partner, "Is there a lump?" And he went, "Your neck looks a bit thick," and I was like, "Okay, middle age." Um, so I decided to do nothing about it because I'm a man. That's what we do. Um, so I did nothing about it and I left it for a month and the thickness and the hardness got worse. And um, You can't just say that and expect me to say nothing about that's it. That's true. It sounds like <laughs> a dick joke, doesn't the it? Thickness, the thickness and the hardness. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate it. Carry on. Very sexy. <clears throat> Sarah Thorpe says I have a sexy voice. I like that. Ooh, and oh, and we've gone out of oh, focus. Oh, we have gone out of focus. It's pretty good. There we go. There we go. Um, so, yeah, so I did nothing about it. Um, then I noticed I was having problems running. So I used to commute into London for work. And as most commuters do, you're always running late, so you're running for trains. And I noticed I couldn't. And it got to the point where I was running for a train in Manchester trying to get home. I got on the train and I passed out and collapsed um, in the dining car, which was useful because it meant there was staff there. Um, and they didn't stop the train, this being a British train, you know, they just kept going. Um, but I was brought round and everyone had said, oh, you know, I, I just overexerted myself. So anyway, I thought, well, I'll go to the doctor's. I went to the doctors and the GP told me off. He said, you shouldn't come to emergency surgery, you should book an appointment. And I said, okay, I said, but I've got this problem with my neck and my throat. Um, my voice is, is raspy, and just to give you an idea, I, I used to um, sing. I was in musical theater for years. And um, I noticed I couldn't reach any of my top notes. I was a tenor and I couldn't reach a lot of the top notes and I couldn't run and I was breathless and had a raspy voice um, and so my GP said okay well I'll check your neck and so what they basically do and I don't know whether Joe's told you how this works before but they sit you down they stand behind you and they, they ask you to t tip your head back um, and they place their hands on your neck and they just examine your neck from behind um, and when my GP sat down, he'd gone grey, um, and he was sweating. And I just said to him, so this isn't good news then. And he said, I need to put you in for an urgent cancer referral. It was just literally out like that. And I was like, okay, how urgent? That's the next day. Um, so I went in, met my surgeon. Well, the guy who was going to be my surgeon didn't know it at that point. Um, he did the same. It's called palpating your neck when they examine it. And he said, don't worry, men your age, what a phrase, men your age often have a lumpy thyroid. So what we'll do is we'll do an ultrasound and we'll just have a look at it via an ultrasound. So I left his office and literally within 10 minutes my phone rang. They put me in for an ultrasound, so I was like, it's quick. Went for the ultrasound 
um, took the bus with my other half and was expecting basically to be told, yeah, you've got a lumpy thyroid and we'll put you on some medication. Uh, the sonographer, so the lady who did the ultrasound, put the jelly on my neck, went round with the probe, and then she stopped and she kept pressing the button, which is clicking to take photographs, mm. and she didn't stop clicking. And what was more worrying was the fact that she was talking to me and she stopped mid-sentence, and then she just stopped talking. And so she brought the lights up at the end, and I was like, so what's going on? And she said, um, I think you have cancer. And that was the first time somebody had sort of confirmed but because she was a sonographer, she wasn't allowed to tell me that I definitely had cancer. So I went back to see my surgeon. And by this time, the tumour in my neck had grown so large. When I was breathing, I was whistling. So it's a bit like blowing on a pipe or a bottle. You could hear that noise as I was breathing in and out. Um, and so my uh, surgeon said, I need to put a probe, so an end endoscope up your nose to go down into your throat and to look at your vocal cord area and I didn't want to have this done um, at all because it's very uncomfortable you don't you don't want it done no you, you just don't want it done it, it's yeah. it's a bit like saying to somebody we're going to put an endoscopy an endoscope up your rear end you just don't want it done it's not pleasant um, except there's no sedation with this all they do is spray your nose with a local anaesthetic um, so I was there and, and he said, I need you to make some vowel sounds. Um, so he was like, can you say A? I was like, A. I was like, oh, okay, can you say E? I was like, E. And he said, can you say O? And in saying O, you really open up your vocal cords. And then he went, O. And I went, O. And he went, no, sorry, that was for me, that wasn't for you. And I was like, oh, right, okay. He said, oh, I'm going to book you in for an MRI. And I'm thinking, Christ, all these tests. Yeah. And all of this was happening within the space of like a week and a half. So all these tests. And um, so he put me in for an MRI. And he said, don't worry. So bear in mind, I've had the lumpy thyroid conversation. I then had the, sometimes people's tracheas are kinked. And I was like, I've got a kinky trachea. How cool is that? Um, he said, yeah, sometimes as you know, there's a bit of a narrowing and a kink. And I was like, okay, fair enough. Um, so he said, don't worry. And so I had the MRI. And um, for those of you who are in the UK, there's a high street store that sells clothing um, and house furnishings called Next. And I was upstairs in Next in Brighton where I live. And um, I'll never forget it. My phone rang. It was my surgeon's number. And... Um, the line you see in movies, which you never think will apply to you, you said, are you sitting down? And I'm like, no, I'm shopping. I'm in the middle of a shop. He said, oh, shall I ring you back when you're somewhere quieter? I was like, not really, because you've kind of given the game away now. There's something wrong. Um, so I said to him, so how bad is it? And he said, there's a grapefruit-sized tumour in your neck um, we think it's a thyroid tumour it has grown round and encapsulated your larynx and it's now grown into the lumen which is the thin areas of tissue between your tracheal cartilage rings he says it's grown in there and it's now squeezing your trachea to 20% of the size of the diameter it should be which is why if you think about blowing a sports whistle there's a little sort of gap there to let the air out to make the noise. That's why I was whistling. And I said to him, could it be benign? Thinking, you know, could I hang on some hope here? And he said, um, absolutely not. He said, benign growths don't grow like this. And so I was told it was a Friday and it was, it was 10 past two in the afternoon. Weird the dates and the times you remember, and that's how I was told I had cancer. Um, and unfortunately, I couldn't go and see him, so I had to wait the entire weekend to go back in on the Monday. 
to go and see him to sit down and then view the MRI images. And the MRI images were hideous. They were they were terrifying. And um, and I said to him, I said, so what do we do about this? I said, do I have to have radiotherapy or chemotherapy? And he was like, um, right now you've got about two weeks to live. It's crazy. And I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, it's growing so quickly, you'll just choke to death in your sleep. Um, so he said, I have to remove everything in there, including your larynx, which is kind of a big deal for me because I was a singer. And, um, and I said, what happens afterwards? And he said, we'll construct something inside so you can still voice. He said, but you won't be able to sing anymore, that's gone. Um, because you don't have the harmonics, which is what the vocal cords do. They're kind of shaped like a U, and they go in and out, and they produce harmonic sound um, through resonance and vibration. Um, and so, yeah, that was kind of it. And um, all of this, by the way, I haven't told you, was a week and a half before the first lockdown in 2020. So I went in for surgery, and that was the 17th of March 2020. And we went into lockdown on the 21st. Um, and I'm the last surviving laryngectomy from that week. All the other laryngectomies in the UK died of COVID. So I'm touch wood, never had it. Um, so I'm the last surviving laryngectomy. So that that's my cancer story. Um, it was poorly differentiated, which was found out in the pathology afterwards, which it took ages to come back because of the pandemic mm -hmm. and um, when it came back it said greater than 50% poorly differentiated and I went what does that even mean and then I found out via a, a really cool charity am I allowed to name the charity of course you are yeah cool so the Butterfly Thyroid Cancer Trust a lady called Kate Varnell who is herself a thyroid cancer previous thyroid cancer patient and a thyroid cancer nurse um, she runs uh, the Butterfly Thyroid Cancer Trust and as soon as I got my pathology back I rang her because there's it, to give you an idea of how rare our cancer is if 5% or thereabouts of cancers in the UK that are diagnosed are thyroid cancers about 2% of the 5% are poorly differentiated thyroid cancers so that's how rare it gets just to give you another statistic of those of us with BDTC which is what we call it it's an acronym of those of us with a hole in the neck which I'm going to show you now it's a fair warning and I can talk just by covering it as well I don't need the little gizmo of those of us with poorly differentiated thyroid cancer, there's only two currently that we know of in the world who've ended up as a laryngectomy. Which makes me extraordinarily special, I think. You're definitely special. In many ways. Yeah, <laughs> truly. Truly. Um, so what else do you want to know, Joe? Um, well, I guess your, your path hasn't run as smoothly as just a here's your laryngectomy, it's, it's over. Like me, you have obviously experienced the even shitter side of uh, poorly differentiated thyroid cancer, which is the aggressiveness of it. And this is the thing is that thyroid cancer is um, typically fairly non-aggressive. If you've got like follicular um, and papillary, um, often you can live with it for years and just do nothing and just sit there. Um, you've got medullary, which is a little bit more aggressive, um, and then you come into your poorly differentiated and anaplastic. So you've experienced the aggressiveness, because um, it wasn't just in your neck, was it? No, so I had what I thought was a cyst on my shoulder, and I had this before I was diagnosed with cancer, and I'd been stood in a bathroom mirror for about a year trying to pop this cyst. And I had um, something called a PET scan after I had my surgery. So I had my surgery, then I had 35 fractions of radiotherapy to my neck, um, which is 
absolutely hideous and harrowing if you had radiotherapy to your neck. No. 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 It's chest, chest, skull, scalp, chest, shoulder. So everywhere else, basically. Just, yeah, pretty much everywhere else, yeah. Um, so neck radiotherapy is really challenging because you have to keep the patient's airway <laughs> patent, i.e. usable. Um, and so you have to try and stop swelling. Um, so you get put on a load of steroids whilst you're having your radiotherapy and the radiotherapy a lot of people think oh chemotherapy is going to be a lot worse than radiotherapy because chemotherapy has immediate visual effects so normally around about sort of 20 odd days after your first cycle you lose your hair um, I was bald anyway by the way I've not had chemotherapy I've just got male pattern baldness um, but yeah, radiotherapy is like a sunburn that doesn't stop and gets worse every single day. Um, so I've had from here, so my beard stops there. And that isn't because I shave it, it's because I can't grow hair there anymore. Um, and my chest hair stops there because this whole area was radiated. And on the outside, it looked like I'd laid in the sun on the Costa del Sol for an entire day with no protection. Um, so it blistered, the skin peeled. What you're going to remember is that's also happening inside your neck as well because they're trying to sterilise the area where the cancer was. And some of my margins on my tumour were only like a millimetre. So extraordinarily tight margins to try and make sure you're safe from this cancer. So I had 35 fractions for radiotherapy. I then had a PET scan and um, something showed up on my PET scan on my hip and it was about six millimetres wide so tiny in the scheme of things and then this showed up as well and they said can you take your shirt off please when I went for my appointment for my results well that's a bit weird where are we going here take your shirt off so can I just have a look at your shoulder and they saw the lump on my shoulder and what I'd noticed but thought nothing of was there was a whacking grey vein going into the lump because cancer has to be fed it needs nutrients and it, it forms its own vascular network um, and that had happened to the tumour on my shoulder and unbeknownst to me my cancer had become systemic and I was stage 4C it was in my bones and from that point on I was incurable um, and in the space of five months the spots on my pelvis grew from six millimetres to around about 15 centimetres um, and ate through the bone um, I don't have any pictures to show you to hand but if you imagine what if you had a crunchy or a piece of honeycomb and you chopped it in half that's what the inside of my pelvis looked like. It had just eaten through the bone. Um, so I had a um, a large tumour debulking on my right hip, plus a brand new hip and a half new femur, all in one go. Um, they rebuilt a lot of my pelvis um, with uh, bone cement, which is really clever stuff. It's boiling hot and it goes in. So it damages all the tissues around it. And that's what they don't tell you, including the nerves. Um, so I was paralysed for three weeks afterwards because it damaged the nerve into my leg, my femoral nerve, so uh, the muscles on the top of my leg wouldn't wake up. Um, and so, yeah, I've, I've had this, which changed my life forever. I now walk with a limp and I have one leg an inch longer than the other, which often happens with this type of surgery. It's as exacting as it can be. It gives me a chance to walk again because I got to the point where I was in a wheelchair. I couldn't walk. Um, so I can now walk again with a stick, which is great. Um, and I've had four cycles of radio iodine therapy, three of which didn't work. The last one did, which is kind of weird because it's weird. It's weird. as your cancer progresses, it normally gets worse and less differentiated which means that the radio iodine shouldn't work but for some reason it showed up so my cancer went oh actually I'm hungry for some iodine I'll have some of that um, which is good because it's taken radiation 
into the areas in my pelvis where I still have motor tumors in my pelvis. So lungs, pelvis, soft tissues in my pelvis, skin, um, and obviously my neck. Um, and yeah, so right now I'm in a space where I've had three major surgeries because I also had something called a throat stretch. That was nice. They basically stick a balloon down your esophagus and inflate it. That's cool. Um, so yeah, three surgeries, 45 fractions of radiotherapy to my neck and to my hip, four rounds of radio iodine therapy, a major tumour debulking, new hip, new top of my femur, completely different plumbing now in my neck. Um, he's more machine now than man, twisted and evil. And that's me, basically. I mean, you're evil to begin with. Yeah, okay, so. that's yeah. true. Don't, don't pretend. That's, um, now, I think, to me, the interesting part is that we have the same type of cancer. Yeah. But yet still, our treatments have been completely different. Like, completely, everything we've been through is different. So, you know, two years for me, um, I went in for a neck dissection because I had growth in my neck, had that taken out, at that point they turned around and went oh it's anaplastic it wasn't it was poorly differentiated but that's a lab technician's fault um, and I did six cycles of chemotherapy now you've not had to do chemo um, and good touch wood um, and hopefully you won't have to but for me the chemo was um, quite kind of, you mentioned about the side effects it hits you like a truck when you have it done um, and having had radiotherapy the radiotherapy I've had has been a lot a lot less it's been a lot easier I guess it's been um, I've had a maximum of five fractions um, to my spine in one go and all that left me was tired and it left me with a very strange looking sunburn a square patch in the centre of my back and it actually looked it looked like I'd been whipped at the same time so they, they were literal you could see lines in it and like which isn't normal. They're like, no. that's unusual. We don't normally see that. <laughs> Just, I was like, well, I get, I'm going to assume this is where it's thickest or, or it's thinnest, and more of the um, more of the photons have flown through. Who knows? It's really difficult to tell. Um, and I had a very strange moment where I don't know if you had this at any point, but my hair prickled. The moment they did the, you heard the bang sound. Yeah. I actually felt my hair like go like stand on end and the thing is is that there's no reason for that to have happened and I spoke to the radiolog uh, radiologist after and I was like yeah this happened and they're like shouldn't have done I was like yeah it's high energy photons they have no mass they shouldn't they shouldn't do anything you know shouldn't feel there's anything. nothing to actually do anything yeah. to your hair follicles to make them stand yeah up. exactly but yeah. for some reason I felt it and I felt it felt, felt, it, felt it exit my body and I was like well that's got, to, that's got to be working, isn't it? <laughs> and, and, and the thing about radiotherapy is, radiotherapy is tremendously effective. Um, and it, they've got it to the point now where they can use something called Cyberknife. And mm. have you had Cyberknife? I haven't, because it's typically used in a curative setting. Yeah. yeah. And, and Cyberknife is, is, if you think about radiotherapy being a mallet, then cyber knife is like a dental bit. It is it is so precise in where it's going. It's used a lot in um, brain tumors. So a friend of mine from um, uh, from the Marsden um, had testicular cancer that went metastatic. Um, he had lesions in his brain, and he's had several rounds of cyber knife. And obviously, when you're dealing with um, neural matter, you have to be so precise. Um, and the machine is so clever. I mean, it looks like something out of Star Trek. Do you know what I mean? It's, and it's like this whizzy robot and stuff. It's very, very clever. Mm -hmm. But yet, radiotherapy is tremendously effective. The more you have it, the more side effects you get. And with radiotherapy, it does something called chugging. So after you've had your very last session, it will chug in your body for two weeks. And that makes sense. So if you think about the sunburn, you don't wake up the next day and the sunburn's gone. It takes a couple of days for the sunburn to go down and then you tan or whatever. Um, and I had the most beautiful tan on my neck. Um, but I went 
went through hell because obviously I had brand new neck plumbing and a brand new hole in my neck that was then getting irradiated. So I had new tissue that was all knitting together that then they were blasting with radiation. Um, so it was, it was a challenge, definitely. And um, thank God for four to sips. They were brilliant. Uh, so this is a nutritional type of drink that is typically given to people that are unable to get nutrition in uh, in a conventional way, um, <coughs> which is cancer patients all the time because your your appetite is actually totally done in by lots of things um, when it comes to your treatments, your pain medication, um, you name it. It can your appetite can be damaged through through cancer, um, which is interesting because cancer is energy hu hungry. Um, but they've um, they they're still yet to find a way to make it taste good. <laughs> you know, um, that's I say that. Um, I'll have a quick look to see if we have any questions. Actually. Yes, let's have a look and see if we've got any um, questions. That'd be great. Because oh yeah, and also guys, remember if you can throw your questions in chat. We will answer them. Um, so m I think let's have a look. People talking about the sound. Da, 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 da. Um, uh, Cheryl, I'm I'm okay. Thank you for asking. I'm doing as best I can. Um, obviously, wearing this wonderful plastic thing around my neck. Um, you've already asked when you had it. Yeah, so the beginning of 2020. Uh, so I was diagnosed three years ago, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, so did you have to have chemo? No, no, no chemo yet. Uh, touch wood. Um, hopefully you won't, because there's only a one in five chance it'll work. Trust me, I know. And it didn't, <laughs> so <laughs> there we go. Uh, the after effects of radiotherapy. I kind of touched it <coughs> already. Um, I think it's worth talking about the chug. Yeah, so um, the chug produces um, swelling. A lot of swelling internally. Um, so you're unable to do things like swallow properly, so you end up with mouths full of saliva. Um, so I was dribbling a lot afterwards, and when I was speaking, so very quickly give you a, a very quick class in how this works. Behind this button thing, so basically this is a filter. This filters the air I breathe in through my neck, and in the middle there's a button. When I depress the button, it stops the air coming back out. So a bit like you you could breathe in and out through your mouth. I breathe in and out through the one hole in my neck. Um, and when I want to speak, I push the button down. And in the back of my trachea, so what's left of it, because they took about seven centimeters away, um, there's a tiny valve. So there's a little tube and it joins into my esophagus. Um, so it's a tiny little tube and they puncture that when they do the actual laryngectomy, so when they remove this. So I had a level four neck dissection of laryngectomy and they puncture through to join them together via this valve. And the back end of the valve is quite a large plate. And so when you push air through the tube, the plate vibrates, which means your esophagus, your food pipe vibrates and that's what's creating the noise you can hear. So whereas normally your larynx would vibrate, they'd stretch, they'd narrow, um, and they would produce resonant sound, we're basically creating a rudimentary larynx with my food pipe. The reason why I tell you that is because the chug with radiotherapy burns everything on the inside. So not only am I cleaning blood clots out of my stoma where the tissue is so raw it's bleeding, so I'm coughing up blood, not through here, but through here. So that's weird. When I sneeze and I cough, it comes out my neck. Which most people go, hang on, how does that work? Um, so my two pipes are completely separate. Um, esophagus, trachea, totally separate, joined by a valve. Um, after the radiotherapy in the chug, it all swells. You get a lot of lymphedema, um, if anyone knows what that is, water. So you get a lot of fluid under the skin. Mine's never actually gone away. 
So what you can't see because of the angle we're at with the camera is this is my fattest side of my face. It's one of the reasons why I grow a beard because I have a lot of loose um, tissue in here that's just full of fluid and that's never gone away. Um, but also when you speak or when you try to voice because it's excruciatingly painful after radiotherapy, you produce or your body produces thick, foamy saliva. So if you imagine you've been out in the sun, you go indoors, what's the first thing you do? You have a shower and work on after sun. Your body produces its own type of after sun um, in your gullet. And so when you talk or when you try to voice, you throw up, not as in vomit, it just comes into your mouth, this sticky white mucus. And it's, um, it's a bit like if you imagine chewing on a marshmallow that's just really gooey and it just won't go away and it sticks to everything and it, it stops you voicing it can stick to the back of the valve and stops all that working mm. so I just learned to talk and then I had radiotherapy and I couldn't speak again um, but my, um, my husband learned to lip read so in that time he learned to lip read so the great thing is now when I'm tired um, because I'm making something vibrate that shouldn't your esophagus shouldn't vibrate, it should stretch, but it shouldn't resonate. So doing that to the esophagus, even over time, still makes it sore. Um, so when I'm tired... So I just said I talk like this to my husband, and he completely understands everything I'm saying. Um, so yeah, so the chugging bit's horrible, it lasts for two weeks, and then gradually your symptoms improve um, and then that's when they take you back in rescan you see if it's worked I think that's the other thing as well with treatment is that you go in for treatment and you've had the treatment you think oh great I've done it I've, I've done my 35 fractions I feel like death on a stick but I've done it and then you have to go straight back into hospital and you're being injected with dyes for contrast and it's it, it literally never ends um and I'm, I think your life is a bit like this and my life is like this. I go from hospital letter to hospital letter. Yeah. In fact, I can see hospital letter on your desk for the CT yeah. department. That was cancelled. Yeah, that yeah. was cancelled. <laughs> um, and I do, I live my life between hospital letters, which is a really weird thing to do, um, but you become really short-termist when you're told that you have incurable or terminal thyroid cancer which is I just have to stress for anyone watching it is remarkably rare for people to get to the stage that Joe and I are at um, extraordinarily rare so if you're sat there and you've I'd see that somebody earlier on said they had a diagnosis of papillary thyroid carcinoma it would be extraordinarily rare for you to get to this point yeah. really really um, rare it's worth actually pointing out how Mark and I met, uh, because I think we—it's not like we um, we were we were friends and then we both got the same type of awful cancer. Um, we met because of the cancer. Um, we were actually, as Mark has already mentioned, um, the Butterfly Thyroid Trust in Cape Thyroid. Um She put us in contact um, where we did a webinar um, together, and it was very interesting because. I came in from a very, uh, everyone knows me, as a, as a uh, what, what did I say that everyone keeps quoting back at me? Because I talk all so much, I say so much and I completely forget what I say. Um, was it science, truth and fact? Um, and that's always my approach. Um, I came in with my amazing PowerPoint presentation timeline. And then Mark came in talking about how he felt. And I'm like, damn, that is better. That's a much better idea. <laughs> Although that that's much more sensible. But then we stayed in contact after, um, and then we you know contacted each other on. I think we started off on Twitter, then moved to Facebook, and um, now here we are hanging out in person. And you know we, we, we've been chatting and stuff, and sharing our experiences and uh, supporting each other as well as supporting other people, um, because we're reasonably well known within the thyroid cancer community. A little bit now, aren't we, yeah? Yeah, I, I really, like, over the last 
last three weeks my YouTube channel has grown by like 300% so I'm like oh, hi everyone <laughs> um, but yeah so I just I'd mention that's how we that's how we know um, I can't sit any closer to Mark by the way I just want to port, uh, point out Lena I I would no I would I'm, I'm perfectly happy to but I can't just because we don't have enough space so I'm sorry for that um, now Um, it has plenty of what the yeah trust me that goes through us a lot of one. Oh, how's my shoulder um good question well as far as I know it's still broken um still got the fracture at the uh head of the humerus it's not as painful as it was which is good but I still have zero function so I, I can't lift it up if I want to um I can still get good good, good you know, grip strength um, forearm rotation and stuff like that and if I want to I can uh, mm, shouldn't I can but I shouldn't um, bend like this way show it with the arm that works so it's uh, that's how that is so really at the moment with your your arm mm. it's your musculature holding your arm together because your main rod your bone through the centre of all that is currently broken and I, I think it's really important to point out to people as well that once a break happens in a bone due to cancer, it can't heal back together. You need to get rid of the cancer. Yeah, or some of yeah, the cancer. In order for that to knit back together. And that's what had happened in my hip. So there were, there were fractures through the back of my pelvis. They couldn't heal because the cancer was just there. So the cancer has taken up residence and gone, I'm squatting. Um, so all you lovely, nice cells that would normally swim in and start knitting stuff together, that doesn't happen. Yeah. Which is why we often have radiotherapy on those areas to kill the cancer, to allow the bone to do what it needs to do. Which sometimes doesn't work. Yeah. Which is why I've got this bloody neck brace right, on. In fact, yeah. Um, and the thing is, is that sometimes it's too late. Sometimes you get it too late. And what you think is the, because pain is often the biggest thing, the biggest focus um, for late stage cancer is the, okay, are you in pain, yes or no? If the answer is no, then it's often the case of, well, we'll leave it be. Because the quality of life becomes your real key focus. And then it's like, are you in pain? And I was like, yeah, a bit, let's do it, all right. And then you do it, and of course, um, it weakens the cancer and if the cancer's what's left, then the cancer can obviously be, you know, be damaged um, and snap and be like, ha ha ha, you thought you had me, but you didn't. And it does stupid stuff. Um, but at the same time, if left, you'd be in agony. So you've, yeah. you've really got this like, yeah, I'm in agony now, but it would have happened anyway. It just would have happened anyway. So um, Worse and later on down the line. And, and yeah. you know, at the end of the day, as uncomfortable as your neck brace is, your neck brace is protecting your spinal cord because you're, yeah. not, you're not injuring your neck any further by moving around the, the bits of bone that are in the neck. Yeah, exactly. This is exactly right, yeah. So it's, it's a bit like people often say to me, oh, you know, must be dreadful having a hole in your neck. And I'm like... It's just something that has to be there because if I didn't have it, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. And and it's very difficult, I think, sometimes for people to put themselves in your shoes when you have a terminal diagnosis or an incurable diagnosis. Because nowadays, I think people generally think, right, one in two people will get cancer. But obviously not one in two people die from cancer because if that happened we'd have a much smaller general population than we do. So it's kind of like people go, oh, well, you know, and especially with thyroid cancer, the good cancer, in inverted commas. Oh, no, nice guidelines says you can't say that anymore. Um, it's, it's not good, and it doesn't matter if you have papillary, follicular, really treatable cancers. The fact that you have cancer and that that word is used in your diagnosis makes it a pile of crap. Um, doesn't really matter 
what type of cancer it is. It's, you know, it's like um, prostate cancer can be caught extremely early and people mm. can live with that for years and years and years. It's, it's, it's more of a chronic illness yeah. rather than... Yeah, like diabetes and stuff like that. We've got some more questions. Yeah. Um, I want a quick, quick thank you to uh, Lulu for the super chat. Much appreciated. Um, you really don't have to. Like... I say that you really don't have to, but thank you very much. Um, oh, here we go. Um, uh, lazy fan, hi. Here's a question you've been contemplating to ask: uh, How did getting cancer uh, change your outlook on life? Did it empower you to do things you were afraid slash unsure of doing prior to getting the cancer? That's a question to ask, isn't it? Mm. Do you want to do your answer first? Do you want me to yeah. Take it? You, okay. You yeah. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I'll smash it. So. Did it change my outlook on life? A hundred percent. We were talking about this earlier when I actually came in. Um, a lot of people go through life with blinkers on because they're focused on doing something, getting to work, doing the job, going home, feeding the kids, and so they're, they're process driven. Um, and getting cancer is one thing. Them being told that they can't cure you and that you have a severely limited time span, a lifespan is short, much shorter. That takes the blinkers off and you suddenly see stuff that you never saw before. And um, I mean, I don't mind saying that I have a psychologist that I see every week because I'm looked after in hospice, um, but it's hospice in the community. So I stay in my own home, uh, but I have hospice come in and see me and I also have psychological help from them and we were talking about this need I have to take photographs of things when I'm out so when I'm out and the blossoms come out on the tree trees here at the moment and so I'm taking photographs of flowers I'm taking photographs of living things and it's a really interesting psychological thing in there about these blooms that are in the prime of their life and I, I, want, I have a need to capture that I would walk down the street before and I'd never even look at the trees. And now I find myself looking everywhere um, and noticing so many things that I didn't notice before. Um, and doing stuff. So, um, Lazy Fan, you talked about empowering you to do things you're afraid of or unsure of. I was diagnosed at the beginning of the pandemic my last show that I performed in was in September 2019 and I thought I'd never go on a stage again because knowing that I'd lost my singing voice so I'd, I'd worked in musical theatre amongst other things knowing I'd lost my singing voice and then walking out onto a stage I thought no, there's no way it's not going to happen and I, I had a chance to do some charity work last year um and um, part of that was doing a film and part of doing the film was actually sitting in a theatre and walking on stage and I was utterly terrified because I'm an emotional person um, as Joe pointed out I, uh, I'm probably one of the only people that produces emotional powerpoints um, and um, and the, uh, the videographer said to me are you going to be okay doing this and I said well I don't know unless I try and so I, I walked in through the stage door and what was amazing was it was the same stage door keeper had been there in my performance back in the September and instantly I felt at home I walked through the doors and walked down the tunnel going towards stage and the warmth I felt and it was just like this is okay this is fine just because you can't be audience facing now doesn't mean you can't walk onto a stage work with people in that capacity um and so i did and um i'm gonna i'm gonna shout out my film now okay um the film we made we made to raise some money for our local hospice and we were really happy because it raised nearly ten thousand pounds um and then that film went viral in sort of the hospice community in the local area in Brighton and um, it got to £250,000 
I can't actually say online the actual figure at the moment. I'll do that later. Or I'll get Joe to post it later. Um, but £250,000 and counting from one film. And then it was nominated for an award at the UK Charity Film Awards. And I thought, that is the cherry on the cake, getting a nomination. Brilliant. And so I went to the awards two weeks ago in Leicester Square. And um, it came to our category. And bronze was announced, and it wasn't us. And silver was announced, it wasn't us. There were 14 people in the category. And I thought, oh well, never mind, really lovely to be here. And then uh, Jason Watkins, who's quite a famous British actor, opened the envelope and said, Mark Lutz, which is the hospice that looks after me, do you allow expletives on your channel or not? I mean, I've already sworn, so yeah. Oh, I didn't realise you had. Oh, yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm going to pretend Joe's my husband, and I turned to my husband and I went, fuck me. Um, and we, we'd we won gold, we'd won the category for the 5 to £20 million pound turnover hospice. And so I got to meet Jason Watkins and I got to be interviewed on TV and it was it was bonkers. And it was all in the hope that we'd make a couple of thousand pounds. And now we've made a quarter of a million pounds. And I never thought I'd, I'd be... The irony is I got success on film with a rider of terminal cancer. What's that about? It's weird, isn't it? I'm just dropping the link to the... Um to the Marlitz Hospice. Oh, cool, um, thank If anyone you. wants to know what they do. So that was a drop into chat there. Um, I assume that on the website you'll be able to find your Yes, yeah, it's called video. Mark's Story. There you go. So hopefully you'll be able to find that. If not, one of the mods will um, be one of the heroes that they are, the unsung heroes of live streams, um, who will grab it and uh, throw the actual thing in there. It's nice, nice to meet you, mods. I've heard all about you. <laughs> yeah, they're efficient and German. It's the best thing, best thing you could want. German efficiency. Yeah, it's, it's not a myth. It is not a myth. Watch, job done, <coughs> literally. Yeah. Um, so my answer to that question. Yes. Um, which, oh bloody, why is it a cat? So Alfred's jumping decided to make his presence known. He's jumping at something on the wall that isn't anything to worry about. So, um, the question about the empower me to do things or the anything I was unafraid or unsure of um, so when I was diagnosed with cancer I had always started YouTubing but for gaming and I decided at that point in gaming that I was going to keep things very separate from vlogging because I just started vlogging as well and I'd spoken about a little bit about fitness health um, and in particular pet sex of arson which is um, a condition where your your rib cage goes in slightly. Um, I say slightly; it's it's various different amounts. For example, someone like me, it goes quite far in, and it's um, it's always bothered me throughout my whole life. But I never thought of getting anything done about it, other than improving it by going to the gym and stuff like that. Which is one of the reasons why I went to the gym so much. And I am um, the cancer left me with very little choice but to kind of pull things together and combine the two things so combine the gaming and combine the um, the personal stuff personal vlogging stuff um, together and use them for good sounds like a oh, really strange not for evil but for good but basically I did you know a series of live streams to raise money for the um, British Thyroid Foundation and I've got to be honest I never would have done it if it wasn't for cancer. I just I wouldn't have done. I, I I might have done a show of show of something like you know, done a bit of like a oh hey, I'm doing a live stream and it's for charity. But I did multiple 24 hour streams. So three 24 hour streams for um, the British Thyroid Foundation. You know, raising over twenty thousand pounds and then this this twenty thousand pound. I'm not trying to compete, by the way. No competition. Um, you know, this twenty thousand pounds has gone towards researching, making um, radioactive iodine refractory thyroid cancer respond to radioactive iodine again. So it convert it would convert everyone incurable to curable. 
that is the goal, right? That is the goal um, for thyroid cancer. And um, they're making progress, <laughs> which is absolutely outstanding. Like, I don't know, I can't say exactly what or what drugs because it's, it's they haven't published the research for it yet. But it's, it, it's, I've got to hold on. Like, I, I, like, phase one trials are coming. I've got to hold on. Um, so I'm like, if I can hold on long enough, maybe I'll have cured myself. How insane would that be? <coughs> and you? <laughs> you can. <laughs> so. But, but the thing is, is that once you told, once you're told it's terminal, you spend a long time getting your head around mm. what that means and what that means for the people around you as well. So you've got a wife, I've got a husband. What does that mean for them? What does it mean for their lives, their careers? And all of that stuff. And you have to work through that because you, you, you can't let it sit there unsaid. Yeah. It, it's, you can't do that because that destroys relationships. So mm -hmm. you have to talk about it. And... If somebody turns around to me fairly shortly when the data is published and says, actually, we think we can cure you now. I mean, I'm never going to get my larynx back. No. I'm always going to breathe through a hole in my neck. The damage will always be done. But so, that yeah, the damage is irreversible. But the thought of waking up in the morning and going, oh, actually, I'm cancer-free. I don't have any... I'm NED, no evidence of disease... That would just be... I, I actually have problems getting my head around that because yeah. I've gone so the other way. Yeah. Well, it's because we're living the reality. Rather than that's the dream, we're living the reality. And the reality is is that until that time comes, we are incurable. You know, and it's... Uh, I, I could easily get swept up in it, you know. And, and it's, uh, it's an incredible... It's got incredible potential... Um, and it would be, of course, this wouldn't work. It wouldn't work for everybody, either. and uh, and that's the thing you have to remember. It's because cancer wants to survive, so it changes, and it mutates, and it goes. Oh, we don't do that anymore, um, and then you get stuck with like Teflon cancer, like I've got, where nothing sticks, which isn't great. You don't want you don't want Teflon cancer. Um, but yeah, I think for, for me, like the charity fundraising is a real big thing, and another thing. Um, is what I'll say is that it started making me hug my parents more and I've told them that I've loved, I love them and that is only a recent thing and God I wish I'd said it more often um, and earlier I think that's a, it's a real thing it's like a it, and nothing was stopping me we, they knew well, we, the thing is is we say I love you as we walk out the door. Mm. Love you. And what that actually means is goodbye, see you later. But when you have a terminal disease and you say, I love you, it, it there's so much in those three words. Yeah. There's so much there because it, it's, almost, it's almost like a legacy thing because there may be a day where neither of us are around anymore. Hmm. Uh, so we're having a cat fight. Oh, not, is that both of them fighting? Not, not Mark and I, but my cats. I'm loving that, it's brilliant. Look at that instant fight resolved because there's nibbles. Anyway, right, so, sorry. I, I just can't have this going on whilst it's killing my vibe. Um, so we were getting really deep there as well. We were we? getting really deep. But no, I, I know exactly what you mean. And this is something, so mum and dad, if you're still watching, um, you know, you always talk about things that you learn from your parents. Um, dad, you always told me that you um, you kiss mum on the way um, out the door and you tell her you love her because you never know if you're going to come back or not. Even when she's furious at you for something you've done, you always, always do it. And I have taken that to heart. And I think that is some of the best advice I have ever had. Um, 
Yeah, now we, can, now we have cats, and this is ridiculous. This is Poe's tail. Um, if anyone remembers Poe being a kitten, he is now... Oh. So is, I, I have a French bulldog that's the same size as the cat. <laughs> ridiculous. That's that is ridiculous. Um, <clears throat> I think we've answered that question, haven't we? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I got derailed by cats, but that's fine. That's fine, that's fine. Um, what else have we got? Are we on a spaceship? We're on a Borg cube. Yes. Um, they're not interested in us because they don't conceive us as a threat. No, um, sadly, if you know anything about Star Trek, um, the Borg assimilate um, cultures and technology, but they do it to improve themselves. Mm. Slight problem with the both of us there. Be like, oh, um, we are the Borg. We, oh, actually, we're just going to let you go. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, if, if you're on a ship with us, you're safe. Yeah. Nothing's going to happen. Yeah, we, we, we like your beards. Yeah. We, we're your Borg beards. Definitely. He like. Um, and I've been thinking about it. Um, they might be interested in our biological uniqueness of the That's cancer. True. In That's which true. case, they could take that all away and just leave us. That'd be great. Wouldn't that be good? I, I, I've practically got some cybernetic implants anyway already, yeah. so just to add to it. Mm, they might consider it techno technologically inferior. Well, same with my neck brace. Yes, exactly. yeah, you and I, I mean, kind of weird, sort of down the bottom of the technological scale, aren't we? With we really are there. Our are neck accoutrement. They are basically bits of plastic, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. It's foam and plastic. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Moulded salad, you're asking, have they improved the flavour yet? If you're talking of the Ensure, no, but the vanilla one's okay. But I don't know why there isn't a chocolate one. I thought there was a chocolate one. If there was, I've never had it and they wouldn't give it to me. It's a banana one. <coughs> yeah. I said, remember the banana one is disgusting. Banana flavour, anything's disgusting. Yeah. The only banana things I do you remember those foam banana sweets. Right, the yeah. Squishy foam and banana. The foam they shrimps were fine. and bananas. Yeah. yeah. Those were fine. But yeah, anything else banana flavour is shite. Especially build you up shapes. Yeah. Awful. Yeah, not good. Um Oh, there's uh, a really good question from George there. George, why haven't they cured it yet? Because it's it's not one disease. That's the, like I think this is always the thing, and it's like let's let's ignore any conspiracy malarkey for a minute and pretend it doesn't exist because there'll always be the talk of big pharma, too much money in it, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, the thing is that it is so co cancer complicated. Um, and you know the easiest way to kill, the easiest way to kill cancer is to kill the patient. Um, imagine that, eh? but you don't want to do that. So you have to dial it back to the point where the cancer dies, but the patient doesn't. Problem is the cancer is the patient. The cancer is created by the patient. Um, you know it, it is my DNA. Um, it's my evil twin. You know it's that. That's basically what it is. And it's this. Oh my God. If I could just, if I could get rid of it, of course I would. You know, if I could carry on and life be normal without it, hundred um, percent. I've done a phase one trial. It was geared around one particular thing because cancer's got a particular number of these receptors, um, way more, um, and it's supposed to shut off its, its metabolism. Didn't work. Why didn't it work? My cancer's already mutated. It's changed already, and this is why. You know. My cancer is already immune to a treatment that they've just invented. Why? Why? Like, it doesn't make sense. I mean, so. And a, a, quite a relevant way to think about it is we've just been through a pandemic. And so if you think about a lot of the language around the, um, uh, the what are they called? The injections. Vaccinations. Thank you, that's the word brain fog that happens a lot when you have cancer as well you're like um, so vaccinations was all about binding to certain receptors on the outside of the virus so the shell of the virus cancer and, and particularly our cancer works in a really similar way where it has certain receptors on the outside of the cell that take in nutrients and, and the idea is you find the receptors and you use a chemical the drug to 
turn off those receptors or kill those receptors, starving the cancer, killing the cancer. Mm. The problem being is it's damn clever um, and it adapts. And a bit like the Borg, they adapt and your cancer cells adapt. And it's a bit like you're, you're constantly running a race and every now and then they get ahead of you and then you get ahead of them. But there's no finish line. And certainly with us, there's, there's no finish line. There's just this sort of amorphous open space out front. And we just keep seeing how far we go. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's God. Whoever finds the cure for cancer, they'll make a lot of money. Yeah. And the thing is, is that also the, the, the talk of saying there's too much money in treating cancer. Um, you know, that, it's, 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 that's a very American view. And I, I don't mean that as to be like, you know, to, to be super negative or be um, insulting towards Americans. My wife's American, you know, we'll see all my in-laws are and I, I love them and they're, they're lovely people. Um, but this kind of, the whole pharmaceutical industry is very, very you know, much driven over there. Um, the rest of the developed world has socialized healthcare. So there's no real, there's no cost. Um, and the actually, the pharmaceutical companies sell at a discount to the NHS um, and the, there are the licensing is probably a bigger issue and I've spoken about this a lot um, in comments where people go can you try this 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 and it's all valid treatments it's all treatments that exist for other cancers but there's no evidence it works for thyroid cancer so therefore there's no licensing available even for compassionate use even for direct approaching pharmaceutical companies uh, it's, it's a very different case but if I came up with a cure for cancer tomorrow and one I'd email every single newspaper at the same time two I would um, probably give it away for free that's my very personal circumstances um, I'd patent it and I would give it away for free or if I did I'd sell it for a penny because everyone can afford a penny, can't they? And you know what? When it's a now. Oh yeah, I, I do yeah. hear that, yeah. Well, uh, skiing accidents, eh? Um, and you know what? I would still make millions, but not. Which is really weird and messed up. Yeah. So, you know, I, I look at it, I'd be like, just give away for free. But your name being attached to curing it. Also, if you increase anyone's lifetime long enough, they will have cancer. That's it. That's it, it, it's a it's a biological inevitability. Um, it's, it, this is what cancer is. Um, so <laughs> panic. Um, but you know, from any age, like up, and you take it up far enough, cancer is on your timeline because your immune system, as you get older, weakens. Your cells become more prone to mutation. Cancer, bosh done. It, it, it's what will happen. So, cancer is so complicated. And that's one of the reasons why we haven't cured it. It's because we're not entirely sure what causes certain cancers. Thyroid cancer, unknown. Um, there was one theory it's to do with the radioactive cloud from Chernobyl. Um, there's one theory it's down to dental x-rays or excessive dental x-rays when you're younger. I, I didn't have that. And I could, you know, Can I'm I jump of, in? Yeah, go for it. So my oncologist said to me, when my diagnosis came back as poorly differentiated, she said, have you ever worked in a nuclear reactor or on a nuclear sub? And that was actually the question that I went, no. And she went, oh, it's just normally we'd see this in people who were very close to nuclear materials. I worked in the nuclear industry. And I was like... What thing to ask? I was like, no. And she went, oh, well. And, and I could see the look on her face was, I was really hoping for a yes there, so we could pin it down and An go, easy win. that's why. And when I then moved to the Marsden, where we're both treated now by the same oncologist, I said to her, I said, so what could I have done to prevent this? And she went, nothing, absolutely nothing. So I can still have a bacon sandwich. I can still eat a packet of pork scratchings. I, you know, it doesn't matter. There's, there's nothing known that would cause this. 
there's some theories, but none of them have been proven. Um, but what we do know is that the incidence is increasing, which is really concerning. Um, and we don't know why. And they're working really, really hard on trying to find treatments for this type of cancer. But of course, the golden nugget will be finding out what causes it in order to prevent it in the first place. Yeah. Um, but they, they don't have a clue, um, which is kind of weird. It's very strange, whereas mm. with other cancers, you can say, well, you ate too much saturated fat, or you did this, or you did that. You drank too much. Yeah, you drank, you smoked. Yeah. And I just want to say, for anyone else out there who might know somebody who's a laryngectomy or has a tracheostomy, the question that bugs me more than anything else is, did you smoke? No, I didn't. I didn't smoke and actually and this is the other thing that annoys me that question is really impertinent mm. because it's saying well if you smoked it's you your fault it anyway yeah. yeah and you know, cancer isn't like that it's not vindictive it's you don't do this it doesn't find you it doesn't, exactly. it doesn't search for you ah a smoker at last right. it's not what it does it's like yeah um, and yeah you know, I've had doctors say that to me did you smoke I, 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 I sit there and I, uh, I get the questions of the, you know, did you smoke, do you, do you drink, drugs? Do, and the answer is no to everything. Like, yeah, you know, in my early 20s, I used to get drunk, of course I did. Never smoked, ever, nothing. In any way, shape or form, never. I think it's disgusting, um, always have done. Hashtag um, personal views, personal views. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, smoking isn't very nice, is it? It's it, weird, um, isn't it? Might. I say my generation because I'm, what, 12 years older than you? No, more yeah. than that. 11. No, 11 years, 11, 12 years older than you. And in my generation, I grew up with, with a household of older people who smoked, so grandparents, because during the war, you know, my nan sat there and made artillery shells with a fag hanging out of the gob. Um, and my grandfather was up in a plane doing wireless operating on bombers and smoked a pipe because that was the RAF thing to do that everyone had a pipe um, and yeah it's it's kind of like that kind of weird thing now where you see people you rarely actually see people smoking walking down the street anymore I don't know I, I don't I see think, a person there. I, think, I think obviously we live in different places yeah so um, that, that's a different it, it's I mean, obviously, vaping as as a replacement See, has, has been been quite a big thing, you know. Which it's a step in the right direction, but it should really be a stepping stone to stopping smoking. Anyway, I'm not going to lecture people on no, smoking. No. Any, um, you don't need it because you already know. Because you're not an idiot. Chances are, if you're watching this, um, God, right. Next question. Well, it's more of a statement that someone made about um, about constipation being an issue for their nan due to opioids and I've got to be honest yeah they are yeah that's an issue we won't talk about it too much but yeah it's an issue um bowl of bran flakes every morning actually does wonders just throwing that out there it's what I have yeah. for breakfast um any uh would have been some helpful strategies for coping with anxiety diazepam drugs <laughs> Um, no, seriously. Um, I take every day as it comes, and when I'm really anxious, I take every minute as it comes. Um, and for me, portioning my time up and saying, right, okay, that was five minutes ago, that's fine, that's okay. Um, still moving forward, still doing stuff. I used to get really anxious on a train, and I travelled for a couple of hours on a train to be here today and I got anxious on the train um, so for me I just do things like finger counting so uh, thumb to fingers and there's something about it that really calms me down it's probably something physiological I don't know that's going on um, but yeah I finger count like that and mm. just, it, that repetitive thing just helps my anxiety go down when you get cancer, you are going to have anxiety. They come in the same basket. I don't know of many people with cancer who don't have some form of anxiety going yeah. on. Um, so 
It's interesting though because I had to ask Val as opposed to you've got cancer. We know it's going to cause a fuck ton of anxiety for you. So let us help you with it. I had to have a separate appointment go, I can't cope with any of this. What can you do? Yeah. It's difficult because you you talk to your oncologist and your oncologist is really focused on the cancer. And then you don't you've got the, the clinical nurse support team there and they'll be like oh you know there is help available you go oh oh cool good to know but you don't realise what type of help you need until you're really in the shit situation um, and I remember me saying that yeah I need to speak to someone when I woke up from my neck dissection um, because uh, and I hate to, t- hate to tell this story because I woke up and I couldn't talk <laughs> so you know I found I felt quite right dickhead to the story that'd be silly and but I couldn't swallow either and I couldn't eat and I couldn't drink I couldn't swallow my own saliva without choking on it which is terrifying and I woke up and I was angry I was like angry how did it get this far why is it like this and stuff and it was very 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 much anger like when I found my voice um one of the first words that came out of my mouth was no or fuck I think it was fuck actually <laughs> Um, was because I hurt myself I was trying to push myself up and I realised that I could talk again at that exact moment and I laughed and f- and then I was like no I don't need to talk to anyone now which I didn't need to talk to anyone um, I've had counselling um, for me it didn't work I just really didn't it was either I didn't go on with the type of counselling I didn't go on with the counsellor themselves but it was enough that I didn't feel like the time was productive it felt like I was vlogging because I was doing it over um, video chat so it just felt like I was, doing, I was vlogging and I just decided to vlog more instead <laughs> which has been my my real kind of anxiety release um, plus I also take clonazepam which is uh, you know one of the azepams in the evening so I can get some sleep and diazepam in the morning as a muscle relaxant so that because my neck is so tight um, that helps relax that in the mornings because I've been, I've been laid in one position all night so there's that um, but also I like to play games um, and I like to watch YouTube videos at the same time and if I can play another game at the same time because I tend to over utilise that's my thing is that I do as much as possible and my wife will uh, agree with that she'll say are you, are, you, are you playing two games at the same time again and watching a YouTube video and I'm like, maybe. Yes. So I just need to utilise for a bit. No room for the anxiety anymore. Exactly. Um, and then sometimes I'll, I'll work on my model kits, which I find you know quite soothing and relaxing. You know, you're following instructions, you're doing something, there's a set process in front of you, and it's not like you have to worry about it. You just just does it, and it becomes a thing. I am... Um... I'm an avid Lego builder, um, so I'm into my sci-fi. I'm one of those weird people where I like Star Trek and Star Wars equally. That's, that's allowed, you know? It is allowed, isn't it? Never used yeah. to be, but it's allowed now. We can do that yeah, now. No, yeah. I don't know what my pronoun for liking Star Trek and Star Wars is, though. Uh, well, let's I have to work that tre- one out. Tricky. Well, Star... There isn't, there isn't, there isn't like a Star... No one ever called you a Star Warsy or no. a, a Warza or a, you know anything like that. You was a Star Wars. You was a Star Wars fan. Yeah. In the same way that you're a Trekkie, but couldn't you just be like a? Oh, I'm just a fan of sci-fi. I could. There is some sci-fi I don't like, so mm. a lot of people will get on to me about the fact I can't stand Doctor Who. Like I just. I find. Yeah, I'm not going to say anything. I was no. about to have a hot take, and that's yeah, never good. Don't because I could do that. About having that a hot well. take about Doctor Who is. The Hoovians will come for you. So yeah, they you will, yeah. they will. And they're big in numbers. Especially where I live in Brighton. Like, there's a guy down the road with a TARDIS. An actual real size stuff. Not real t- but a I mean, not real. It's not you don't go inside, it's bigger. Oh, wouldn't that be amazing? No. Uh, no, I have been inside, but it's it's just a TARDIS. Oh, okay. Because, yeah, why not? Yeah. Um, talking about anxiety, briefly again... Um, 
there's there's anxiety and then there's trauma and they're quite different mm. things and I think it's really important to talk about the difference between them um, anxiety is often a slow burn um, so it starts off small and it's not noticed um, you might start doing you might get a little tick somewhere or, or something it starts slow and then gradually builds until you get to the point where I can't cope with this trauma is based on something pretty horrendous happening um, and when we start to talk about so I'm a state I'm a qualified counsellor I didn't bring my certificate to show you who I am it's one of the things I used to do when I was getting cancer and you'd think oh well you know then you know how to counsel yourself no it doesn't work like that um, and when I have my ear operation done I um, I got really sick afterwards I had a massive infection afterwards and um, I don't remember a lot about it because I was in and out of consciousness and um, I do remember hearing a nurse going his blood pressure spiking his blood pressure spiking I remember her voice the exact sound of her voice if I heard her voice in the crowd, I could pick her out. So I remember somebody saying that, and I remember saying, look at his heart rate. And I don't really remember much else. They rang my husband that night, and I was in London, um, in St George's Hospital, where they deal with all the orthopedic side of our type of cancer, when we treated at the Marsden. You mentioned that in your last video, actually. I'm having a flashback. Um, and anyway, they phoned my husband and said, we don't know if he's going to make it through the night. And I knew I was sick, but I didn't realise how badly, I, how badly ill or how sick I was. And my husband was able to come up and see me the next day. And he was like, you know, nearly lost you. And I hit a point of trauma because I was mm. paralysed. I'd been really ill. But then my husband was saying, you nearly died last night. Um, and the hospital were great. There's a lot of people who bang on about socialised medicine isn't a great thing. I had a psychologist sat next to me the day after that. And so they brought down a clinical psychologist to sit with me for two hours and just talk with me because they realised I was at a point of trauma. And it was to try and prevent sort of PTSD sitting yeah. in. Um, so I think... I think that was great. I mean, it, it, that approach worked for me, but there are other approaches that just don't work for me at all. So CBT does nothing for me at all. Yeah. Um, I think it's because I'm just too strong-willed. I, I'm. I know what you mean. Yeah. I am also stubborn. Yeah. Other than strong-willed, let's call it what it is. Strong-willed, yeah. Strong-willed. Oh, no. Yeah, call it what it is. Stop. But no, I understand that one. Um, so I've got a question from Fight Time Prod. Um, any chance cancer was caused by mixed martial arts? Well, number one, I didn't really do MMA. I did kickboxing and karate and kung fu. Um, really unlikely. Um, you, I, I know, and I know you've had a little conversation in chat about it. Um, like repetitive trauma to an area can cause cell damage to a point of which that you can um, develop cancer. But the type of cancer that you typically develop is a sarcoma, um, so it's, it, it wouldn't be caused. And I haven't been hit in the neck ever. I don't think I've ever been punched in the neck over and over again, nor held in a headlock or anything like that. Um, the joy of me, the freestyle kickboxing that I used to do was there was no, grapp no grappling, um, and the gloves were big enough that if someone did try and punch you in the neck, they're hitting your chin and it's hitting your chest. It's never hitting your neck, so. Um, very, very, very unlikely. Um, and also, thyroid cancer isn't caused by physical trauma. Like I said, you get the uh, um, like sarcoma is caused by physical trauma. Um, uh, you know, you look at Bob Marley, for example. Um, his was from playing you know, football on the beach, clashing shins at people constantly. It's uh, it's horrible, but it's um. It's something that is possible. I just put a shout out to Jess, who's an ex palliative care nurse. Thank you. Uh, we both received palliative care, so yeah. cheers for that. You guys are amazing. Um, and not many people realise 
palliative care is not on the NHS. So we do have socialised medicine, but we don't have socialised, I'm going to be very controversial, dying medicine. When we get to the point where we're incurable and we need to go into hospice or have hospice care, it's provided um, in the charitable sector. Yeah. And um, that's, that's a big thing because charities rely on people donating. So if you are ever looking to do something good and you feel like, I don't know, you haven't done something good, donation to a local hospice is a fantastic idea. Definitely. Um, 100%. Obviously, I will always promote the British Thyroid Foundation as a patron of theirs. Um, I, I'd be rude not to, wouldn't I? Um, so, but donation to a local hospice, 100%. Like great thing to do, great thing to do. Um, oh, oh gonna, Misha Hart, thank you. Because I've always loved Joe, but now I'm afraid Mark has stolen my heart. Oh my god! I'm you, so sorry. You absolute <laughs> monster. Oh. I feel so good. I mean, bad about that. Sorry, mate. I think someone asked me how long I have to leave my um, my uh, my neck brace on. Um, in uh, there was an actual question in there. Oh, was that? Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I, I think I always thought I saw it somewhere. Um, oh, also, there's some questions for you. Um, uh, when you had the laryngectomy, did you have to relearn to talk, or was it instant? Um, I'm a rarity. It was instant. So I hadn't talked or said anything for six days after surgery. My speech and language therapist came down. And uh, bearing in mind, there were still stitches around the outside of my stoma. And um, she said, right, we're going to sterilise your thumb. I was like, okay, so it wipes out. He said, pop your thumb over there and just open your mouth and say, ah, if you can. And she expected very little. And I went, ah, and I went, oh, my God. And I actually said, oh, my God. And she went, stop. Stop, don't go too fast. And I went, I'm sorry. So I'm talking instantly. And you're not supposed to do that for a little while. So, um, yeah, for me it was instant. And my husband says, for a man with no larynx, I don't shut up. So. Well, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we talk a lot. We do. Uh, yeah, and like, you don't stop. No. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I'm quite grateful for it. Because it's good to have someone to talk to, you know, who's going through something similar. So. That's always good. You always, um, you always, you always have the mute button with me. You can just tell me to shut up. It's not. Oh working. yeah, I'd be like, hang up and be like, oh no, my connection dropped out. Um, you've done that, Jay. He's like, wait a minute, you've done that before, haven't? He's like, would I? Would I? Um, where are we? I just want to make sure we've not missed anything. Yeah. Um, it's good. Oh yeah, so yeah, uh, Catherine asked about. How long I have to wear my neck brace for? Yeah. Um, currently, the answer is forever. Hooray! Um, but I do have a, an orthopedic appointment um, next Tuesday, which will hopefully do to do with my arm or my neck or both. I don't know. They haven't told me. But I assume we'll be talking about both, <laughs> or I will be. Um, we'll find out from there. Uh, did I notice my nose stopping red after this chemo? Um, I think it was stopping red after the first, after my first set of chemo. It really reduced. It's a red nose at the time. I just, I'm so glad you said that because I was like, why did your nose go red? Yeah, acne. Like, really? so, yeah, I've always, I've always had poor skin on my nose. I've always had like a spotty nose, like uh, uh, since being a teenager. Um, and what also helps is that I finally found the correct skincare routine for me, which is. <laughs> You know, turns out it's a dose of chemo. No, um, uh, it's it's just um, clean and clear, exfoliating wash, and the face pads they do, um, they are non-flushable, just in case. Um, or the clear as silk, oh, clear yeah. ones. These non-flushable, just so you know, put them in a bin. Um, it's a weird thing to be talking about on a cancer block, but there you go. Kimutone, wow, that's incredible. He actually learned to read lips. Yeah, he did. Um, and and still does, so I can't actually swear under my breath either. Um, 
Oh yeah, eating. So, um, there's a there's a great picture. I'll send it to Joe so he can pop it up at some point. After surgery, um, because the piping was all changed on the inside, um, and it was healing, um, because they, in essence, create a new esophagus for you. They take away the larynx um, and the voice box, and then they create a new esophagus, a new tube, uh, which also means it the tube doesn't move or slightly out of focus. Are we back in? No. I don't know. I need focus. When it does that. Oh. Come on. There, there we, we go. go. Um, so, yeah, there's a great picture of me, and I had an NG tube, so a nasogastric tube, went up my nose, down into my esophagus, into my tummy. And most of the time you see them put in place with a piece of elastoplast. And that they'd actually sewn mine into there on my nose. With, so you could, you could see the black sutures. And so every now and then, I would turn round oh. and I'd catch my arm mm. on the tube that was which was hung up next to a feeding pouch. And I would pull. Can, can you imagine? What, you know, like when you've got a hair or a spot just on the inside of your nose. And it, why do spots on the inside of your nose hurt so much, by the way? Very thin skin. What is that? Oh, it's awful. It was like that. So in case you had knock it, it would pull. I remember when I had the nasogastric tube out, I was more worried about the stitches than the matchy pulling the whole thing out of my nose. Um, so yes, I had an NG tube. When I had my radiotherapy, they wanted to put a tube in the side of my belly. Oh, God, I have okay. it's kind of moving too much. They wanted to put um, a line, feeding line, into my belly, and I said no. And they said, but with the swelling, you're not going to be able to eat. Um, so I said, well, if it comes to it, you can put an NG tube down again. Um, but thankfully, it didn't come to it. I went down to liquids, but it didn't get any worse. So, yeah, I did have a feeding tube. Um, the impact on eating is I have to chew stuff a lot. And I have to drink a lot as I eat. Because there's no peristalsis, there's no ripply movement anymore in my esophagus to push food down. So food is pushed into my belly via gravity. Oh. Um, so it also means I can't eat in reclined positions and stuff like that because it doesn't go anywhere. Oh God. So I, I swallow and then it just sits there. So And you wait for it to go... Yeah. And Do you feel it hit your stomach? Sometimes. Um, but I've got something called a stomach pull-up. So where they took out a bit of esophagus, they pull your stomach up through your diaphragm, so they give you eye to hernia in essence, right. which is fun. Um, and you have to be on constant meds, the omeprazoles and things yeah. like that for that. Um, and ad actually, the stomach acid coming up can erode the back of the valve, oh, um, and they only last about four months, but when that happens, they last about four weeks. Right. And you have to have them swapped in and out. It's a little five-minute procedure. It doesn't hurt. Uh, um, people think, oh Christ, that looks awful. It doesn't hurt. There's an applicator. They put one in. You can voice straight away. It's very clever. Yeah. Cool. Was there any others? Me, Charles, I still love you. Um, what else have we got? What's this about the bone healing process? Oh, that's because we were talking about um, the uh, yeah, uh, radiotherapy ah. and stuff. Um... That's a red, so moulded salad. Great quote. I guess it's all on a sliding scale of terrible when you have cancer. Pretty much. Yeah. Well, what happened to the growth of my shoulder? Uh, so crayon. Um, it's still there. It's smaller, so it's about half the size it was because it's responded to some treatment. Um, but it's still there. Um, I haven't had it cut out because at the moment it's responding to some treatment, so there's no point in cutting it out if it's responding to radiation. Um, there is a school of thought that if you leave tumours where they are, they can seed other tumours in your body. Um, so if it started to grow again, I'd say to them, can you cut it out? And they've already said to me they can do that. So if it does start to grow again, I'll just have it removed. Yeah, that's fair. Um, uh, it's a question about uh, pain medication 
uh, is it helping me set up bridge oxycodone um, and your nan um, had fentanyl due to pain um, I'm currently waiting to talk to the palliative care doctor um, about switching over to fentanyl patches because I'm having problems um, there you go. I'm having problems swallowing tablets at the moment because of the leftover swelling from the fracture it means the tablets are getting caught and oxycodone tablets are vile they taste vile absolutely disgusting and when they get caught you gag and when you've got a neck brace and a constantly sore neck the last thing you want to do is throw up and I've puked twice this week and it was awful and I'd rather not repeat the experience so um, I'm going to move on to something easier if I can take less tablets good for me so especially if it works that's the important thing is it works um, I know that with fentanyl t um, patches there I've been told there's a 24 hour period for them to work so I'm gonna have obviously a really rough 24 hours um, which I can top up with with uh, oromorph or paracetamol and all those all those good things um, and see what happens the uh, the great thing about fentanyl patches is once <clears throat> they start to work because you go on to a cycle of removing and replacing you never get that 24 hours again yeah so it's then constant you're constantly at a, a level of medication mm. so we've just upped mine so patches should last three days I've just gone to two days because my pain wasn't controlled well enough it's now controlled well enough yeah. and the reason being is apparently my body was sucking more pain relief out of the patch than most people's does okay so yeah which is really strange I was like super how does that, skin. yeah how does that work but apparently it's done it because it needed to do it and now I'm fine so every, every two days swapping over my level of pain is probably a two or three whereas prior to that it was about a six or seven um, and you know what living with chronic pain is like yep. it's it's pretty unbearable and then the meds you take for it when they like ox oxycodone um, also comes in liquid form and um, this is also grim it's it's like having the worst shot of your life um, I ate tequila and it, it for me it was it was like the sourness and oh it's just gross yeah um, whereas Orenwolf actually tastes great it's sweet it tastes like raspberries it's only because they flavour it it tastes like raspberries mine does I need, I need to maybe I have children's Orenwolf I need yours <laughs> Orenwolf try some good. afterwards yeah. it's fine definitely for sure um, oh um. Somebody was saying something about how do you push someone you don't know very well oh. into getting tested. Andy Man came over and he had a very weird looking asymmetrical mole. And I told him he should really get it checked. He dismissed me. And simple answer is you can't. You've planted the seed. Yeah. That, that's, the thing, that, like, that, that's all we can do is you plant the seed. And from there, they will it'll eventually become their own idea, and they'll go and do it. <laughs> hopefully, it won't be before it's too late. Um, hopefully, it'll be well in time that it's been caught and and handled, you know, and can be dealt with very, very easily. Just like uh, just to scoop it out and you're done, you know. That's what you'd hope. But <sighs> approaching strangers about their bodies. Is it's a bit of a modern taboo, really, isn't it? Yeah. And you, can, no matter how you want to do it, you're going to come across as an asshole. Um, like I, I know, I know, there's been celebrities who have been tweeted, and you know, like a group of people then tweet at them and say, "Yeah, yeah, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this." And I think, you know, that's okay because it's a co it's a chorus of voices, but a one-on-one -on -one situation. If someone came up to me and said, you've got a lump on your neck, I'd be like, fuck you, who are you? You know, you, you wouldn't, I would have to go with the, excuse me, I've had thyroid cancer, um, and I've got, you know, I've got the scar and stuff, and the reason why I've come up to talk to you is because I've just noticed that you have a bit of a, a bit of a lump there in your thyroid, and I hope, you know, don't take this the wrong way, but it might be worth you getting it checked out and contact the doctor. And you know, fingers crossed. I'm just a mental person in the supermarket. Who came up to you, 
um, and that's the best case scenario. And if not, you know, you're all good. Yeah, like, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. That I mean, that's the only way I could do it. But it's so awkward. Like, I don't even think I would take it well. Stuff like that, I don't think I would take it well. I mean, my my husband when I found the lump. Um, said to me for six weeks, go to the doctor, go to the doctor, go to the doctor. And the more he said go, the less I wanted to. Um, but in the end, I realised there was something going on and I had to get it sorted. Um, not at any point, I think it was cancer. Um, but yeah, I think I think it's very, very difficult, even in a relationship, to point out something on somebody's mm. body. And, and actually, it's probably worth talking about people's reactions to you as well. Yeah. So I've had people in the street point and go at my neck, which I've got to be honest with you, in 2022, last year when it happened, I just thought, I can't actually believe somebody's just done that. And this person, was it a grown they, up? They, when they were, yeah, they were grown up, they're an adult. They were with their significant other and she physically stopped and pointed and went, Ugh. and my husband had, her. My husband held my hand and just said, keep walking, ignore her. And I was just like, I, I've got to be honest, that's, I think I've only maybe had two or three negative experiences. I have a lot of people who hear me before they see me. And so they turn around and go, because obviously I sound different. Yeah. I sound like there's something slightly robotic and artificial about my voice. Um, so I do get people who turn and then you get the double whammy of them, they see this, and then you see the panic on their face. Great. Because they've turned and looked. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then you see them trying to turn back without looking as though they're trying to... I find it quite funny, personally. Um, that's my sense of humour, I'm afraid. <laughs> I, saw, I think that's the way it goes, isn't it? Because, I mean, I don't... The neck, the neck brace and the sling, obviously my newest things that people notice and can see. And honestly, I get um, I get bumped into, um, and that's it. And it's just like, thanks, mate. And I get really annoyed about it. Um, so, um, I think that was someone asking the name of your charity film. Uh, it's called Mark's Story. Um, and if you follow the link that Joe posted to the Markland's website, um, if you type it in their search bar, you should be able to find it. Um, oh, actually, there, there's a post on there at the moment about it winning the award, so it should be relatively easy to find. Uh, was interesting. Gabe earlier on said he works in musical theatre and he couldn't imagine not being able to sing again. Um, I can tell you, um, I've gone beyond imagination. I've done it, and it's doable uh, because if you work on stage, you know how things work. And you can apply that learning to other things like directing or producing. Um, and I got involved last year with a show in Brighton um, and sort of sat as a mascot on the production team. So you can still get involved. Uh, it was difficult, but I do miss my voice. If I still have, if anyone ever rings me, you'll hear me from prior to my surgery because I haven't changed my answer phone. And occasionally I listen to it just to go, oh yeah. Hearing you sing, by the way, I'm sorry. That, that brought me to tears. Did it? Yeah. Was it that I bad? <laughs> I mean, I didn't have the heart to tell you. Okay. I was like, I wondered how we, people kept letting you get on stage, but I know. they must have felt sorry for you or something. Well, yeah. Quite a successful feeling sorry for me, though, so. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I suppose you, you rode the wave big time. You're an arsehole, do you know that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm aware. <laughs> Um, Love you. Yeah, you too. Um, but yeah, like um, I said, it, it, it did. It just, it was just like hearing your voice. And I was just like, oh my god, that was inc your voice is incredible. And you. you know, I talk about. I don't know if you notice the word, my language when I talk about your voice now. I say when your voice changed. Yeah. I don't say when you lost it. Yeah. Because you've, you still have a voice. It's changed, and you're using it still. So, yeah, I think that's it. It's a very I know that I can position anything any way I like and say it any way I like to someone who's gone through a different experience, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you feel the same way. Yeah. You know, and it's like, a, to me, that's how I look at it. Um, 
and you know, my family and the people who are close to me say I still sound like me, but with a really sore throat. So because I've retained my intonation, mm. and the weird thing is, people say, "Well, can you do an accent?" And I can still do an accent. Well, go on, so, then. Go. okay, um, nothing offensive. My famous one, which is Dawn French, which is the one that she does in all of it. I are you. So, Northern Irish, I can do a little bit of that. Um, but it's because people forget that the voice is actually made here, it's not made here. Mm. The sound is made here, but the actual accent and the phonics and everything's all made here. Um, so, yeah. Um, you know, I can do a, a Scottish accent if I want to do one. Not very well. I know, but you can tell what it is, yeah. Um, I come from Dorset originally, so my accent when I go home for too long changes to be a little bit West Country and I do start to sound a little bit like that. You sound like a farmer. I do sound like a farmer because know. that's kind of where my family is from. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> right, let's see if we got... Oh, by the way, if, if anyone watching knows the production company that does the voiceovers for Channel 4, because Channel 4 use people with different abilities to do all their voiceovers but I've not heard a laryngectomy do it yet and I want to be the first laryngectomy to do one of their announcements I need to write to them really don't I yeah I think that'd be a cool thing to do I'd like yeah. that there's definitely there's definitely websites you can set yourself up a profile as a voice actor um, oh yes yeah, yeah. do that so it's you have a dreadful that. moment there I thought you're talking about OnlyFans I'm like no I'm, I'm hoping there's not a market for this <laughs> I can't no. No, exactly. You know what? Let's leave the audience to yeah. uh, imagine any of that. Or not, is the case. Or not, maybe. please don't. I'm really sorry to put that idea in your head. Sorry. Well, we can't, honestly, I've got to you got to I thought, laugh. I thought, I thought you'd be safe to be on. I'm so sorry. And you've gone, <laughs> and, you've gone and mentioned OnlyFans and spoke it as like, oh, God. <laughs> I own only laryngectomies. Does this mean I don't get a taco now? <laughs> no, sorry. No, no tacos for you. No tacos for you. Um, cats are great. Well done. Um, obviously, thank you to everyone. See so when the cats arrived. Yes. On that one. Um, Jojo, thank you very much for the um, super chat in there as well. Oh, thank you, Jojo. Um, That's cool. Also, it's, it's crap to hear about your father dying about yeah. plastic thyroid cancer. I am really sorry to hear that. Um, it happens fast very fast um, I mean, it's unlikely that, that there being a world that would have caused it very unlikely um, there, there's actually a thing about um, with men who get thyroid cancer they often have a much rougher time of it um, and and this is from Professor, uh, Professor John Wadsley yeah um, who is like um I know. N joint joint first expert, yeah, I'd say. Definitely joint um, amazing. For uh, thyroid cancer in the UK. And that's kind of based on his experience of um, men with thyroid cancer and treating them and seeing them and um, they often have a rough time. And again they don't really know why, do they? No, no clue why. Zero is there a reason for 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 them knowing why that's the case? So from a proportionality perspective, more women get thyroid cancer than men, but when men get thyroid cancer, they have a rougher time of it. Yeah. 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 Um, someone's asked in there, uh, Patty, you said, is the cancer mutating? Um, I don't know who you're talking about, mine or Mark's. I the answer is almost definitely constantly. yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that's one of those things is, that's what cancer does, unfortunately. It's, um, it's always on the move and it's always doing something weird. And you never want it to be doing that thing. You, you want it to be just shit, <laughs> sitting yeah, yeah. down and shutting up. And um, yeah, the difficulty. I mean, if you think about a normal cell in the body, it will divide and replicate and make a copy of itself. And the problem with cancer cells is it's a bit like using a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy. It starts to look wrong. It starts to look more and more wrong. So it gets what we call less differentiated. And more differentiated, sorry. Um, so it becomes more different to a normal thyroid cell. Um, and then that just gets worse and worse and worse. So, <clears throat> yeah, you've, you've unfortunately. You have said it the wrong way around there. I have, haven't I? Yeah. 
it becomes poorly yeah. differentiated. Like so it becomes um, less differentiated. So it becomes less like its original um, copy. So they've actually found it in cloning, where if they clone a clone, then that animal starts to not live as long and has problems with it. It's called genetic um, drift. Genetic drift. Genetic drift, yeah. So, yeah, that's... Um, and with cancer, is it just continues to replicate faster. Um, and also, cancer can de-differentiate to the point where you have two cancers next to each other that started off as the same thing, but then they actually start working against each other because they give off chemical signals which... Um, disagree and so they start fighting each other um, for nutrients or chemical signals and one of them will die or it will happen in, in a tumour um, a single tumour in the middle something will go wrong and it will begin to be like, mm, no I'm not doing that anymore and then but I, I've got some friends who aren't going to do that either and then it, it kills the tumour from the inside out which is nuts we want that. We like that. We like a spontaneous tumor death. Which, interesting, both of us have experienced in some mm. of our tumors. Yeah, I haven't I haven't shown it off, and um, I've spoken about my scalp lesion quite a bit. And you guys know, in my last video, <coughs> I took my hat off, and I went, "No, you're not seeing that bit. Um, that is my my tumor I've got here. It shrunk a hell of a lot due to radiotherapy, um, but." Um, I'm worried YouTube will flag it as like a, a wound or something yeah. iffy, so I'm just not going to do that. Somebody said, how is Mark's pain? Does he get a lot of pain? Um, yes, I do get a lot of pain. It is manageable, um, and it's manageable from two ways. One, I'm medicated well enough, but two, like most things, you get used to it. So what was unmanageable maybe three or four months ago I can deal with now, which isn't really a great answer, um, but it, you do kind of come at pain from two different angles. You get used to it, therefore it becomes wallpaper, um, plus you're medicated for it. Um, so it's, it's that kind of balance. And you don't want to be over-medicated because when you're over-medicated, that comes with a whole host of side effects the vomiting you were talking about yeah. uh, plus disassociation um, so when I was really poorly at St George's um, they put me on the drug that I can never remember the name of it's a recreational drug ketamine um, so they put me on ketamine and I was on ketamine for four days and um, it had some very deleterious side effects I was totally disassociated. I didn't know who I was. I didn't understand why I was in the hospital. Um, so they took me back off it very quickly. And then they put me on the fentanyl. Um, and I had that as a syringe bum driver into my tummy before they put me on the patches because they needed to know that my body could deal with the fentanyl before they graduated me to wearing a patch. Um, so, yeah, I do have pain, but thank you. It's, it's manageable. And... Um, and when it isn't, I tend to go to sleep. Sleep that is great, about actually. Right, actually. Yeah, sleep is a sleep is a weird. It's a weird thing because you think you'd be in so much pain you can't sleep, but actually, your body is really good at zoning out. Really, really good at zoning out. I, th I think the pain also exhausts you mentally so much that you just go, and the brain just goes right enough sleep time. Um, questions oh Nuke brings up a wonderful point of the are more people getting cancer or is it because we're better at finding it yes both and even more so after a pandemic when nobody's gone for checks for three years mm. so at the moment there is a spike that will level off but at the moment there's a spike because you've got loads of people coming through the system who didn't do anything for 18 months because there was a pandemic. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, pitch black, what a ledge. Love it. The future of nanites can target and kill cancer. I 100% agree. That's why we've got the background. Yeah. 
Um, Patty, do either one of you have an autoimmune disease? I don't. Yeah, so prior to my diagnosis, unbeknownst to me, I had something called Hashimoto's thyroiditis, mm. um, which is an autoimmune disease of the thyroid, um, where it starts attacking itself um, and makes you hypothyroid, so pretty low. Um, and I didn't know I had that. I had all the symptoms for it, i.e. depression, um, weight gain. I was treated for all of those from a symptomatic perspective, but nobody thought to look at my thyroid. And I was treated for those for about six years. Bugger. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, and they found that when they diced up my tumour afterwards, they saw it in the tumour. God. Amazing, isn't it? Mm. Uh, it's like, hello, Tato. How you doing, mate? Good to see you here. Um, he is a ex-cancer patient himself. Um, he had bowel, um, I think, colorectal. And um, has made it through it. Awesome. So well he's, he's a good lad. Um, um, ben, thank you for the super chat. Uh, you say, you know whales don't get cancer like humans do. Uh, maybe our future should be evolved back into the ocean. God, that'd be beautiful, wouldn't it? Except we filled it with plastic. <clears throat> we did fill it with plastic, which is unfortunate. Um, there, that is the interesting thing. So about, you'd think, this is the weird, such a weird thing. Humans are a, a very odd species of animal because we live longer than any other animal for our size. You compare another animal that's a similar size to a human, a goat, a llama, how long do they live? 20 years? 15 years? Something like that, tops. Um, so, do, do they get cancer? Not very often. Um, and that's based on their size. But humans live long enough that we do get these things. But then, the bigger the animal, the more cells they have, you think the more increased chance of having cancer they do. Like elephants for, um, are another example. They don't get cancer. But then you have another completely strange outlier, like the naked mole rat, who is a tiny animal, doesn't get cancer. Um, and with that, we've managed to research it. We know the reason why. Um, can that be applied to humans? No. It's all to do with the telomeres, which protect the DNA as it reproduces the cells grow. And also, they're, they're rats. Um, that live for uh, 30 years which is pretty pretty crazy that is um, um, I, know, I know sharks there, there's a lot of studies going in uh, looking at sharks and the fact that sharks don't get cancers like we do mm. um, they also live inordinately long lives yeah. so the Greenland shark is that they found one's about 400 years old yeah I was off the coast of the UK at that now. It's like, that's just amazing. And it was healthy. I don't know how they know its age. I don't know how they know the age of a shark. Did you, 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 you half and you get the rings? I mean, how does that work? I mean, I'm glad one of us made that joke. Exactly. That had to be in there. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's an odd one. It's just, nature is full of some really weird stuff. Um, and there is, there is you know, a lot of cancer treatments come from nature. Yeah. Like uh, chemotherapies are often based on um, trees, or like the, the chemotherapy I recently went through is uh, based off of the sap of our tree, just highly, highly condensed down, and one of the chemicals taken out of it. Um, you get nothing from chewing the bark, but you know you take it down and condense it, and you've got this treatment. And yet we're cutting down all the rainforests. And yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, who's Gizmogs, isn't that? That's the name of my pooch. Okay. That's, uh... Yeah, and, and yeah, and stopping smoking is... Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I've got family members who, who smoked, and I saw them go through trying to stop smoking, and uh, I never realised how hard it was until I started to take drugs for my cancer, so pain-killing drugs, and then coming off some pain-killing drugs, I experienced withdrawal. Hmm. And I'd never had that before, um, because I'd never done drugs and I hadn't smoked. And so then I was like, oh my God, I get it now. This is really, really tough. You can see why people jump back into it. But yeah. well done for stopping, though. Yeah, good on you. Um, because we we're kind of, 
we've actually streamed for longer than I was planning already. Oh, wait, we have. Yeah. We? Um, so we're going to kind of wind down. So we'll do like any last uh, particular questions people might have. Um, on question to what models? Gundam. Gunpla. So uh, plastic robots. They are my absolute favourite thing to do. I love them so much. Um, great fun. There's some great, great suggestions on how you uh, match Star Wars and Star Trek together. Yeah. If you're a starter and a Trekkie meets Wookiee, you're a Trekkie. I love that. That's brilliant. I might call myself a Trekkie. That's awesome. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I just want a seven of nine, okay? Let's not do that weird thirst about her. Yeah, let's Come not. on, guys. You... <laughs> You, you've only got a fifty percent audience interested in that. Um, so, God, uh, I don't think we've got any particular questions. I'm sorry, oh, you whiz, you whiz, whiz past Mark seems like a lovely man. That was very nice of him to say. I told you, chat lie all the time. Okay, fair um, enough. <laughs> uh, Michelle, Michelle, thank you very much for your super chat as well. Yes, thank you. Again, really appreciate it. Um, we're going to have some something to eat after so thank you um, we're fantastic can you do more together well, can we I'm game if you are I'm, I'm totally up for it I do feel a bit like we're the sort of um, the two Ronnies of the the terminal cancer world <laughs> oh, okay. I'm, I'm the one that constantly laughs at his own jokes I mean someone's got to haven't they well that's very true you don't yeah. that one um, I lyrics. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> thanks, thanks, Dad. Two boys. Oh, that's gonna be Mum. In fact, um, two two boys, robot models, and Lego. What can I say? We never um, grew up, did we? Really? You know what? I like I like the fact that um, as full grown men, we don't, we're not under pressure anymore to to do that and abandon things that we enjoy, because you can just keep doing them nothing stops you um at all like nothing yeah that follows my bum um <laughs> the two boys with robot models yeah sounds about right um it's just something you can carry on doing you know I, I um this society this is my my personal view society forces you whether a man or a woman or however you identify to become this thing called an adult and basically all adulting is is paying bills, potentially buying a house and having a career. And there's this underlying, not really said thing of you need to stop doing things that you did as a kid. And I've never understood that. And I've never stopped. So I've always played with Lego. Yeah. And I didn't realise at the time that Lego is one of my anxiety cures. It chills me out so much playing with Lego. Mm. Um... I'd recommend it to anyone. In yeah. fact, when I was doing um, when I was doing workshops for big companies in the uh, city of London, I'd always take a box of Lego with me. And the amount of CEOs who were in there like a shot, it's like Lego. So yeah. Yeah, because that's, that's a new thing that like fidget toys and like even for during training sessions and meetings, yeah. you have them. It's like at least you know when people you know you've lost someone. Or you know you need to bring exactly, them back in yeah. or stuff like that. Um, that's it. That's true. Um, you had uh, Nuke say mock story explanations have really helped him gain a, a better understanding of all his thinking. Lovely. Oh, I've actually got a question. Um, before moulded salad, I tell you off for giving too much money. You should not have done that. It's very kind. Uh, it's very kind. I mean, it's going to be a lot of nachos. That's for sure. Um, so, um, Joe Running Dog uh, Productions, um, how do you feel about the series you made looking back on videos you made at the beginning of all this? Well, I'm not done doing, doing the series. Um, I, I've actually found it very enriching, um, very informative to myself. Because when you... Who gets to go back and look at a moment in their life with absolute purity of clarity and go that's exactly what I said that's how I felt that's 
the way I acted, um, you know, what, 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 what could I, you know, and, and looking at, was I right to feel that way? And it's always, the answer is always yes. You know, I was always right to feel that way. I've definitely grown throughout the course of the journey with cancer. Um, it, it's really a, an experience that I think it's a privilege. You know, this, I, I mean, you must have moments where you wish you could go back and look at them and uh, look at them in 100% clarity or how you felt in a moment and look at it and be like, God, I really remember that now. Like, it's really like that. I, I, I don't vlog, um, mainly because I'm a bit scared of technology. Somebody would need to show me how to do it all. Um, but I do post vociferously all over my Facebook account. Um, so if you want to become a friend, just look me up. Uh, you'll know it's me because there's, there's, a, there's a face with a hole in his neck. Um, <laughs> same thumbnail as this video. Yeah, same thumbnail as this video, yeah. Um, and interestingly, I look back at a post from a year ago and I was talking about the film I made earlier on. All of it started a year ago today, the 1st of April 2022, was when I sent my first email to the theatre company saying, oh, you're doing that, Mark, this looks after me, can we join up and do something together? And that was a year ago today. And I'm like, oh, well, and it, it is that great thing of reading over it and, and it stirs emotion in you where you go, oh, yeah, no, I, I remember mm. how that felt. Um, but like you, I'm I'm just not done with all this this shit yet. I need to do more. Uh, it just it's it's when you get taken back to a moment. I think that's always it's like a it really does um, take you back. It takes you back to the moment and it puts you there in the feelings. And, and one of the videos that I did that was particularly tougher than I thought it would be was when I you know I, I went back and I reviewed the It's Terminal video that I made. And that was the most viewed video on my channel. And I went back and I looked at it and I was just like, at that time, in that moment, going through chemotherapy, um, the being, what felt like physically beaten up by the chemo, mentally beaten up by the idea of having to um, deal with what had happened and what's gonna happen and all of this kind of stuff. Um, and then knowing that it was wrong, which is crazy, like just absolutely the the reconciliation between the two, and going back and watching them and talking about it, I think has been really beneficial, really, really beneficial. Um, but yeah, like trust me, there are moments you wish you could go back in your life and watch or rewatch and look at them. Um, because I make my vlogs and that's it, I upload them, I don't watch them back. When I edit them, all I do is top and tail um, and that's it. And which is why some things slip through. Maybe there's a cat meow in there or, or there's um, a, a noise in the background. Um, it's because I, I don't watch them because I've just said it all. I don't think I need to. But going back and watching them has been very interesting, for sure. I um. You were talking earlier on about talking therapies. A lot of them haven't worked for you. Mm. I think you do your own. I think that's what yeah. your vlogs are. I think that's your therapy. Um, and certainly when I watch your vlogs, um, sit there, have a bit of a, a blub and a cry sometimes. There's some, some really tough ones in there to watch, especially when you know the person yeah. who's talking. Um, but they're also really, you know, there's a cathartic element and there's, there's, even though you explain things um, in such a calm, metered manner, there's still packed full of emotion. You might not necessarily hear it in the voice, but you can hear it in the language that you yeah. use and the facial expressions you have. Um, yeah, they're great to watch. I love watching them. And I'd love to do some more with you. That'd be brilliant. Well, I will continue to do them. It seemed seems like you're not the only one as well so cool. um, definitely um, are there any recordings of you singing Mark can people find you yes there are um, I have
haven't got to the point where I want to really guide people to them yet because I still have difficulty listening to them um, and I normally cry when I listen to them because I realise what's not there mm. and what's different now um, but there are um, and there are some probably there's some you know, in fact there are there's some videos on my Facebook page um, so if you're interested friend me on Facebook and um, look through my videos on there you were so brave asking the complete strangers of the internet to get you on to add you on Facebook yeah I'm, I'm crazy brave and apologies if I turn around and I don't let you in because I think you're a crazy person like I am um, no it, I mean I I yeah, I, it's, I'm not one of those ones where you can add in instantly. Um, equally, I won't make you jump through loads of hoops to say, hi, I saw you on your video with Joe, and I, you know, I'd like to see you sing or something. And, yeah, you know, if I can get to the point where I want to start posting them now, then, you know, I look forward to doing that. It's um, it's also because it's been my, what I call my surge anniversary. I have three of them, but my surgiversary, my major one for this, was only a couple of weeks ago. And so that's been quite a challenging time for me. Um, and so very quickly, actually, my my friends threw me a voice going away party. So four days before my surgery, we went to Lucky Voice in Brighton. And we had their biggest room. And the songs were all musical theatre all night. So it was all my friends who were in theatre came down from London and um, and I got up and I sang I sang about five times till I was hoarse um, and everyone else got up and sang and it was an amazing thing uh, but it was also a line in the sand as well and I knew after that it was like okay that's it all done we, I, th I think I think we all as you reach a point in your journey where you know something is over yeah um, life before cancer or even life as a certain point of having cancer that is then over um i i had it i did a um i did a live stream where i did beat saber i think i told you about it and in, anyone doesn't know beat saber is a vr game and in it you've got a lightsaber in each hand and these blocks fly at you and you slice them and you dice them and it's in in time with music and um i did this live stream the night before my um, neck dissection and when I came out of my neck dissection I could barely move my arm I could barely talk barely move my head I couldn't, I couldn't really move my neck all these things and I knew that I'd done the right thing at that point you know you, you know when you've done like a yeah this, is, this isn't a bad place to put a line you know or this isn't a bad place to um, be like yeah you know this is cool I enjoyed this um and I wish I'd saved the stream, and I didn't, which I'm really annoyed about. Um, but it's it's one of those things where I did it, and I I got to kind of I was really scared about the surgery. I thought I thought I was going to die during it. So, but I was on the table for eight hours. So it's a long time. Yeah. Um, you know, and it, and it does. So you got these things. You, you you do this thing, and you do a thing before it scares you. <clears throat> you know, before you're about to do something that really scares you. Um, like the same way I went to Mexico and I swam with whale sharks and I knew this holiday with my wife would be the last big holiday that I could do because I was aware of what was going on you know the treatment I was on um, the scans had showed some advancement whilst I was doing it and I'm like yeah this is going to be it this is going to be it like the end is of this treatment is coming and the likelihood of me being able to go and swim with whale sharks ever again seems pretty unlikely. Um, and then, yeah, went, did it. And um, but that was my like drawing a line at that point. Um, shout out to Kim, who is oh, suffers from motion, terrible motion sickness, and spent the entire time thrown up over the side of the boat and didn't get to swim with whale sharks. Oh, bless. So because of that, I, t I took us to another set of ruins. I went, there's no way we can't do something. No, that's uh, yeah, I was just like, no, there's no way yeah. we can't. I have to look after it. Um, but I think we're going to call time for the stream there. Yeah. Um, Mark does not have a YouTube channel, um, which uh, it is, is uh, I'd say, is a shame, but then you'd be taking away my viewers, you bastard. 
because you are far more charismatic than I am. Oh, shush. <laughs> so, um, but you can go and check out Mark's story um, in support of the Martlet's Hospice down in Brighton. Um, but I'm going to call time for the stream there. If you haven't already and you've been watching, you need to make sure you hit the like button, subscribe. Um, also, guys, I do have channel memberships on. I haven't mentioned it before, but I do. So if people look at looking to support on a like a regular basis, that is something you can do. If not, don't worry about it. Donate to your local hospice. Um, far better use of your money. And we're going to go and eat some uh, tacos and uh, and uh, burritos, probably. Awesome. So, um, Mark, thank you for joining me. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you for inviting me. I was terrified, and I've had an absolute whale of a time. Whale of a time. Whale of a time. <coughs> you know. Um, so, that's not, hey, thank you very much. Cheers. And I'd love to have you back. Thank you. Um, and everyone else who's been watching, um, once again, thank you very much for hanging out, and we'll see you all soon. Bye. Bye bye.